All right, we'll we're gonna do this in uh, three, two. You started recording over there, right? One, yes. Okay. Ah, so today we have on center stage Racer Five. Yum yum. For your tum tum. And here we go. Let's get everybody poured up here. Senor Jorge. Thank you. Let's add an inch to our gut. <laughs> there you go. That's how we do it. So tonight we have Mr. Joe Cheers. Nesbitt, right? Nesbitt, that's it. All right. Nice. I said it right. Mm-hmm. And uh, oh, I, asked, I asked, oh, let me see here. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite Good beers. Stuff. Yeah. So I wanted Joe to come in because I checked his profile out on Instagram and I was like, oh, ho, ho. we stalked him. Don't lie. <laughs> this fucking guy's nuts. He's jumping off of cliffs. He's jumping off of mountains. He's jumping out of planes. He's jumping out of just about everything from, I mean, I, I, I was looking at it. It looks like, you know, cities are like these little tiny specks down on the ground. And how high up are you going sometimes in a plane? Uh, in the plane, it really just depends. Uh, on the weekends when I'm teaching wingsuiting, we're going up to like 12, 5, 13,000 feet. Uh, I've gone as high as 22, 23,000 though. But, oh. You know, when you're in a wingsuit, you have so much more time in the air anyway. Like 12, 5, 13,000 is plenty enough. Well, why don't you tell everybody exactly what it is that you, you do, your, your, like your whole thing there? Because I, I know you're, it's called the fast way down, but what, what are all the things you do? So skydiver. Uh, which is jumping out of airplanes, a uh, base jumper, which is jumping off of a fixed object. So base is an acronym, stands for building, antenna. Like the Eiffel Tower? So the Eiffel Tower, would t- it, it's a building, but it's also an antenna. So it, it kind of falls into two areas. Oh, okay. Uh, a span is a bridge and earth is a cliff. So okay. base jumper is jumping off of one of those objects. Um, I'm a wingsuit pilot and instructor as well. Saw some of those videos and we're going to play some of those. So wingsuiting is basically putting on a suit that, uh, pressurizes and allows you to fly around. We can cover miles. Um, so you have a wingsuit skydiver, which is doing it out of an airplane. And then you have a wingsuit base jumper, which is jumping off of something fixed and then flying your wingsuit. And, and what's your favorite of all of those? Wingsuit base jumping. There's, so like, there's the, nothing like, like it. The one, and we'll, we'll, we'll show that one. So right it's now. right now. <laughs> so it's it's the one where you're it's like a red Sedona Grand Canyon kind of colored cliff. Where was that? Okay, that one. Uh that is in Moab, Utah. It's actually uh, okay. in Castle Valley. Uh it's this jump we call Super G for super gorgeous. It, it's definitely the absolute best view in Moab, which is saying a lot cuz every place in Moab is just absolutely stunning and beautiful. But then you get to the top of Super G and you've got Castle Valley right there and you've got Castleton Tower and you've got the LaSalle's in the background. And I'll tell you, you've seen it before. Have you guys seen the TV show Westworld? Yeah. So Westworld, they filmed most of the outdoor stuff in Castle Valley. So the, okay. the shots where they're like doing the landscape shots and you see the big mesas left and right. They're just taking a helicopter up and down Castle Valley. Okay. Damn. Now I, I've, seen, Damn. I've seen a few of these... Um, videos over the years it seemed like not that many people were doing it, it was like oh what's that look at these flying squirrels but uh and now now i saw your video your videos and it seems like you do it quite a bit how did you get into it um i'm the guy that'll try anything once <laughs> and if i like it i'll keep doing it so when i was growing up my dad was a skydiver uh, i kind of grew up on a well, that's not really said fair to say i grew up on a drop zone but we went to the drop zone frequently and a drop zone is a place where you jump off an airplane mm-hmm. so i got to be the annoying little kid running around messing with people air packing <laughs> wanting to play in the training harness uh there's pictures of me like three years old wearing the gear uh i used to fly right seat in the plane all the time so i, I kind of grew up around that um and then when i turned 18 he took me on a tandem jump for my birthday did it, I think, like 20 and 21 as well. And then when I was in college and actually like was starting to make some money, I decided to start skydiving. And from there, it just led to base jumping. And then base jumping led to wingsuit base jumping. Okay, cool. we'll, we'll show another one of those videos. But Right uh, now. Right now. <laughs>
but that i mean those videos are just insane it's it's uh it, are you, obviously there's an adrenaline thing there and uh there was there must have been like a natural progression in overcoming fear right absolutely yeah you you definitely people think that we're not scared i'm scared every single time now there's definitely different levels of fear but fear is definitely what keeps you in check um, sure the times i've definitely looked back and realized i wasn't scared I've usually looked back because something's gone wrong and I've realized that I fucked up and I got complacent. Sure. So I'm definitely scared every time, but you're right. It's something you step into. So people see these videos of me, you know, flying down mountains and they're like, oh, I want to do that. And I want to do it tomorrow. It's like, cool. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It might not ever happen, but there's definitely a progression to see if you can make it happen. Not everyone's cut out for it. Uh, you know, if something rolls off of a desk are you the type of guy that fumbles it? Or are you the type of the guy that grabs it without even thinking about it? Or are you the type of the guy that like lets it fall on the floor? Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with any of those. It's just, you know, there's certain things you can train. And there's certain things that are just intuitive as well. Sure. Yeah. So it seems and like... That's well put. <laughs> yeah, that's right? That's perfectly put. <clears throat> so I, I'm sure you've lost people. I hear people do die in this sport because it's so dangerous. Absolutely. Uh, a lot. A lot, a lot. And I, I don't mind talking about that at all. I mean, everyone wants to know about that. But I also want to, like, when we're done talking about that, talk about the positives, too. Oh, well, of course. Well, yeah, the, uh, it's a lot, man. <laughs> I don't even know how many to say. Uh, 2016 was like a battle of attrition. Uh, I think we lost 20 people total in that one year alone. And I personally lost 10 friends in one year. Um, and back, I want to say back then, four years ago, Four years ago, it wasn't as big as it was today. Like, it is growing exponentially every year. Um, but we probably lost 10 to 20% of our of wingsuit base jumpers in 2016 alone. It, it was crazy. Okay, and, and why is that? Because you're misjudging your velocity and making turns and you hit a, a cliff wall or a tree or what happens? So usually it's somebody, almost every single time, it's somebody not deploying so when you're flying a wingsuit you also have a parachute on so at the right. end of your wingsuit flight you deploy your parachute almost every single wingsuit base jumping incident involves somebody impacting without a parachute out now that doesn't mean they're like flying all the way bottom and hitting the ground it means they're clipping a tree or they're clipping the side of a cliff or they're stalling out their suit maybe they're flying too flat and they don't have the energy to get over what they need to get over oh wow Ooh. It just scares me right there. It's like, ah, 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 no, no, ah, splat, right? <laughs> it's definitely the worst. I mean, uh, there, I, w I wouldn't want to see it coming. And there's there's, there's definitely been instances where we're, we, we looked at what happened. We're like, okay, that, that guy didn't see it coming. Like, it happened so fast. Like, yeah, he messed up, but it happened fast. And there's other times where we're able to look at it and be like, wow, that guy knew he was dying for like 10 fucking seconds. Like, just trying to fight it. Oh yeah. God! Uh, that that so so you're you're riding that life and death thing, which obviously that must be the most ultimate adrenaline rush. It is. It's crazy, man. It's like I said, it's growing exponentially. Uh, getting in now is way easier than it used to be, uh, which I don't, it, which isn't a great thing, but that's not really what we're talking about. Um, but it used to be like this really exclusive club. There wasn't that many of us. Like everyone in the community knew everybody else. We all went to the same places at the same time of year. Uh, we all trained together. We all flew together. Like we pretty much knew every single person. And it was cool because like we did these incredible things together. I mean, there's not that many people in the world that would do it. And we would go out and we would get to share these experiences together. So it's not just like the jump. And of course, you get this high at the end of the jump, like mm -hmm. an insane high. Like, wow, sure. we just did that and we did it together. So there's definitely like a, a major bonding thing that's mm -hmm. happening. I mean, it's almost like taking drugs. It's like take a bunch of drugs, take a bunch of Molly or something. And all of a sudden, you know, I hear people have this, you know, reaction of, oh, we feel close together. It's mm -hmm. because of all the endorphins being released in your <laughs> brain. Right. Yep. Same thing happens for, for base jumping. You you get these endorphin rushes and flushing through your system. Sure. And See, you so feel like you have instant connection to the people you're doing it with. Nice. Oh, yeah. So for everybody doing Molly out there, try base jumping. There you go. <laughs> If you yeah. want to put it behind I, you. I would recommend something safer <laughs> and cheaper, like drugs, hey, honestly. Do you, do you remember that movie, The Croods? I do not. Okay, th th there's a scene in there where they figure out how to like take portraits, and they just they take a rock, and they smash each, smash each other in the face like a big, huge boulder, and there's a family portrait. 
So like these are, you know, if, if you uh, accidentally hit a cliff, it's kind of like a, you know, family portrait in a way. Damn. Damn, how was that? Yeah, that was... I don't know why I thought of that. Maybe yeah. I'm just trying to put a comical spin on it. Could be. Because it sounds freaking scary. <laughs> yeah. It sounds scary w- to think that someone could, like, just splat on a cliffside and, like, the just the 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 visual of the trauma of it and <clears throat> it must be horrifying it's not something you want to see uh pretty much everyone in the community has got ptsd whether they admit it or oh, not Oh god i can only imagine i mean i've seen it other people have seen it i've heard it for some reason hearing it always bothered me more than seeing it and i think it's because i've probably heard it a couple more times than seeing it but yeah hearing somebody impact so what kind sucks. of stories do you hear there not to get too morbid for too long but Oh, no, I mean, like, hearing somebody. Oh, ugh, just yeah. this. Oh, yeah. God. I'll take the Crude's family portrait. There you go. Um, That's crazy. <laughs> I know. I, I've been, uh, I've gone skydiving twice in Lake Elsinore. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I like it. I mean, I, I'd go again, you know, and I'd want to keep going until I eventually, uh, wait, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, I can't hear myself, but we'll keep going. I can hear you. Okay. So, um. And, you know, I like it. And uh, being up there, to me, it felt peaceful. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if everybody else feels that way. But as soon as you're like, you know, or not even as soon, but when you're diving down, and you just see, you feel the wind and you feel you're seeing everything. And it, I don't know. And then when you pull the parachute, it's just quiet and peaceful. And then you're looking at like the world and you're like, wow, this is beautiful. Like I, I could do this a million times. But then... I don't know. It's just I wish I had the money to do it and continue it because it, it, it's it's awesome. Well, let, let's take a look at another one. As I was saying, it just seems, I mean, it felt peaceful to me and it, it's its definitely a rush, but me, I wasn't really afraid of it, you mm-hmm. know, and, and the tandem dude is just making jokes like, you know, oh, we're going to, what if the parachute doesn't employ, but it's like, whatever, I guess, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess because I'm with him, so I feel like he's just messing with professional, whatever, but it is definitely something I wish I could have pursued a little more. I don't know about the, um, uh, what do you call it? The suit? The wingsuit? The, the wingsuit? Yeah. But I, I watched your videos and everything, and I'm like, man, it's just. I, and I and I, used to, I show my dad all the time because the stuff that people do when they go in between, like, uh, I guess holes, like in walls of rock, or just like the craziest stunts. I, I wish I had my phone to show you, but it's just awesome. Mm-hmm. It's almost like when I used to look at spear fishing with Eric. You know, yep. it's, it's like it's something I wish I can get into, but never have the time or the money and. It, it's awesome, dude. It, it's crazy. <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned spearfishing. Like, to me, emotionally and mentally, that is the closest activity i found to wingsuit base jumping. Like, when I tell people it's the same thing, it's actually the complete opposite, except the way it feels. Okay. You know, when I'm about ready to... Absolutely. S- when I'm stepping off a cliff in my wingsuit, or when I'm about ready to take that drop down into the water, like, it's the exact same feelings. And it's a chemical reaction. That... that feeling of calm you got Mm -hmm. that's your brain uh that's your personal response to fight or flight so when we get in a fight or flight uh situation our brain dumps a chemical cocktail into our frontal cortex it's dopamine norepinephrine serotonin and basically what it does it's made to stop cognitive thought because cognitive thought takes time so even if you're just deciding between red or blue a or b one or two Mm -hmm. there's a measurable time of making that decision and when your body is in fight or flight, a lot of times there's no time for that. So sure. instead you have to go on on instinct or, or what do you – instinct is like what have I done before that I subconsciously remember? So, body memories. Exactly. Training, so, training, training. And that was actually a question I was going to ask you. What kind of training do you do for that? You have to visualize everything. So there's there, there's training and then – there's, there's real world training and then there's, you know, hey, what am I doing right before I'd make this particular jump? So like I said, I've been doing this, let me think, 13 years now and it's been a journey. So I did a lot of skydives first and then I did a lot of base jumps 
and then I did a lot of wingsuit skydives, and then I put it all together and did a lot of wingsuit base jumps, and then that was just to get me started into wingsuit base jumping. First, I would hop in, and goal number one is don't die. Just fucking fly away from the cliff, open your parachute, and land. Okay, cool. You literally just did the most dangerous thing in the world. Now you can start building on that. Um, Hang on, bear. And then, yeah, and then over time, you just kind of... Uh, you kind of see like what you saw in the video of me, you know, flying down the mountain a couple feet off of it, mm-hmm. uh, which looks super sketch and super danger, dangerous. Um, but by me flying super steep like that, it gives me more energy to bail if something goes wrong. So there, there's the training of getting to that point. But then, you know, when we go back to talking about, you know, instinct versus cognitive thought and decision making in a situation where you don't have time for cognitive thought to get out of a situation, you had to have already visualized that. So before every single jump, I'm thinking about what can go wrong. If I fuck up this exit, if my parachute opens facing the wrong way, if I can't make my backup landing or my main landing area, where's my backup? I needed to have already thought about all that beforehand so that in the moment, I'm just going right to it and I'm not having to think about it. So do you visualize a game plan like looking down? Like if you're looking down or like even like when you drive up, you're looking at it and you're going, okay, there's a spot, there's a spot, there's a spot. And then when you're up at the top, you're looking down, you're going, okay, you like visualize a whole game plan in your mind kind of thing? Absolutely. And not just that, you know, we use technology too. You, you look at videos of other people flying the same line. You hike the line if you can. You look at the uh, topography map. Um, you use everything in your ability. We've got these uh, GPS trackers now that go on the back of our helmet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they track our speed and our uh, glide ratio as well. So we train with those. So that way, after like so many jumps out of an airplane and off a cliff... I've got a great data set and I can say, okay, on an average day in these conditions at this location, this is what my glide ratio is going to be and what my speed is going to be on a, If I fuck up the exit or on a shit day, you know, this is my lower limit. And then this is like best performance. And so that allows me to kind of, you know, look at the terrain and figure out, Hey, you know, is this a smart jump or not? Wow. This sounds like getting into a uh, backcountry skiing or boarding off of a helicopter, but even more insane it is you have to be a hundred percent self-reliant or the group has to be self-reliant um i've been involved in a lot of base jumping rescues just because you're out in the middle of nowhere um and a lot of times the cool thing about our sport is the people a lot of times the people in your group are going to be just as qualified as the people that you're calling to rescue you um and they're already there they're not going to have a 10 to 1 safety factor like search and rescue is going to have Um, I've been involved in multiple rescues now where we never even called search and rescue. We just called a professional climber that was nearby or another professional climber that was on the trip or or used a helicopter that we had for the project. Um, We've got a pretty cool community. It sounds pricey. (laughs) It is pricey financially, emotionally, mentally, relationships. It costs a lot. Sorry, sweetie. I've gone fishing. Or I mean... uh, uh, (laughs) skydiving or <coughs> base jumping is it wingsuiting is that what it would be yeah. so wing what would you call yourself a joe's a freak <laughs> freak of nature well you're hanging out with us so you're yeah. obviously a freak so so there's two things i'm a well i'm, I'm several a, a wingsuit base jumper a okay. base jumper and a skydiver like it, right. it's kind of all those things are different things but you can combine them as the well. skydiving daredevil i want to be superman burrito Exactly. I definitely oh. want to be a burrito. So how fast are you going in the suit? Uh, so it depends on, first of all, whether we're talking vertical or horizontal. I assume you mean horizontal. horizontal. Yes. Yeah. So it depends on what suit I'm flying. Angle, uh, everything, huh? So angle of attack as well. So if I'm in the mountains and I'm flying my really big mountain suit, uh, I tend to Ooh, have... there's different suits. Superman has five suits. You hear that? Uh, I think I've got four. But four. Oh, I can almost close. <laughs> at one time, I had five. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if I'm in the mountain, I'm flying my, my big slow suit. The great thing about that, I fucking love this suit. It's called an Aura. I can fly 85, 90 miles an hour and still get a two-to-one glide ratio, which means for every two feet I'm going forward, I'm only dropping one foot down. So for big mountain long flights, that that's what you need. The suit I skydive in would stall out at that speed. So it's made for much, but I can go way, way faster. I can hit 130, 140 in it again, but it's hitting that right angle of attack. 130, 140 in your 
mountain suit? No, 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 no. Your, your the, skydiving uh, suit. Skydiving suit. So it's more petite, the skydiving suit, because you want more speed, right? It's trimmed differently. So they, it, they're they're made like it's modern. It's tailored wings. specially. They are definitely tailored specially. That suit, as well as another suit that this company gave me, they uh, I gave them my measurements, and they've known me for years and made a bunch of suits for me. And on both of them, they called me and they're like, they say we're gonna make. Joe the gorgeous on that mountain. Like, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna take some. We're gonna tighten this up and take an inch out. Let's cut out a hole in his abs and emphasize. There you go. <laughs> Show the abs. <laughs> so yeah, the suits are made to fit tight for sure. See, I'm thinking Superman the whole way. Yeah. I mean, how many people dream about like being able to do shit like that? You know, like I've always had those dreams about flying and woo, do 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 Superman. You know, to actually be able to do it. That's a, I think this is about as close as That's you get. Insane, dude. Although I have to say, completely off topic but you just reminded me of the superman dreaming to fly we were diving for lobster last night and uh we ran into a patch of bioluminescence love it dude i just turned off my light and for probably 20 minutes straight put my hands in front of me and swam and just giggled like a little girl oh yeah because the bioluminescence made it look like i was flying through the matrix oh yeah i just absolutely. gave up on the lobster it was great <laughs> I, i've had a few nights like that in in, in my years of doing it mm-hmm. for sure the bioluminescence at night is just there's no word to describe it. It's, it is seriously like watching uh, Ken O'Reeves uh, at the end of the uh, the first Matrix where he's like figures out that he's in the Matrix and there's all these lights around and mm-hmm. whoosh, from the, the code or whatever it is. But it's it's so exciting. It makes me want to open this uh, <laughs> <laughs> stone tangerine express IPA. If you drink two of those, Eric, you'll be in the Matrix. <laughs> you'll wake up. I am the Matrix. Okay. And pop this sucker up and... So we try not to take ourselves too seriously here because it sounds to me like what you do is some fucking serious shit. And I would be ecstatic and terrified at the same time to do it. And I would love to do it, but I just, I don't think it's in my cards as much as I want to. I did skydive once Mm -hmm. and I was tied to somebody, you know, where they, you you do the tandem and that was amazing. That first jump, like when you first roll out of the plane, that feeling of weightlessness, it's like being in the womb or something, you know, it's insane. Who would like some refreshing IPA? I'll finish this and have some. Okay, come on over yeah, here, Jorge. Right. I know you want some. Yes. Is that a good description? Uh, floating. Uh, floating. Yeah, floating so there, there's feeling. definitely a human desire to float. Uh, and it, 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 as a result of that, certain activities where you get to experience that, people are drawn to for sure. But I would recommend skydiving for anybody and everybody. Oh, it's amazing. Do it once. See what you think. Um, you know, when I say it's life-changing... People think I'm using hyperbole. Is that hyperbole exaggeration? They, they, were, they both work for me. Same, same. I'm rolling yeah. with it. Uh, I'm on your vibe and that's all that matters. People, don't matter people think I'm using hyperbole. I'm not. It literally changed my life. Like it took my life in different directions and multiple times in my life, I've made major life decisions so that I could skydive more. It's how I ended up in California in the first place, ended up in Santa Cruz. And then living up there, I was actually coming down to Paris Valley, which is by Lake Elsinore, mm-hmm. to train every weekend. I said, well, this is fucking stupid. Like, I'm spending one or two days in Santa Cruz. Let, let me just move to Southern California, work a couple days a week up in Northern California, and then figure it out from there. And so I did that. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I still think about the times I've skydived because it was just a, one of those things, you know? It's like you'll never forget it, mm-hmm. you know? And you always think back, and it's just such an experience. Yeah. Everybody's got to do it once. We, Absolutely. Me and me and two of my friends, uh, we're, we're like the three amigos over the decades that we've gone and done all kinds of crazy stuff. We always do extreme stuff together. And uh, we did some stuff in Europe and, and here and there. But we did do the skydiving. We did the glider planes, all that stuff. But when we did the skydiving, <clears throat> it, it, we, we met these guys and they were so cool and they were messing with us. And we have the whole videos of it and we got to put our music on it and all that stuff. But about a month or about a year later one of my friends in that group he's actually a, a firefighter he's a paramedic and he was dropping some bods off at the hospital and uh he he saw one of the parachute instructors one of the skydive instructors come through and i guess uh he he had someone attached to him and the chute didn't deploy so they or they didn't fully deploy but he got he got pretty messed up so i know it's dangerous mm-hmm. so i like i did it once and i'm like Okay, did it and survive. My buddy Tom just saw the whole thing where it didn't go so well. But I hear the statistics overall, though, are actually pretty good for skydiving. It really is. So I, the USPA is the governing body. They put out statistics every year for publicity, basically. 
I can't remember the exact number. I think it's like 1.3 million jumps are made every year. And there's usually in the U or that's in the I'm sorry, in the US. Okay. And there's usually between like 15 and actually in the high period, there's 15 and 20 deaths. I think we're down to like 12 to 16 these days. Okay. Um, so out and of 1.3 million tandem. jumps. Yeah. And those are people doing what I used to do and what a lot of people still do and flying these small high performance canopies that are basically playing chicken with the ground. So that's, okay, that's, that's so where almost all the deaths Good come stats. From. Yeah, for sure. So uh, one in a million. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. One in a million chance. But and that's not tandem. I think right? most years you'll you'll never see a tandem incident. I mean, there's definitely been a few years where there's been one or two for sure. Now there's tandem incidents. I mean tandem fatalities. Damn. It, it is skydiving. I mean, there is Still there is a people. level of danger to it. I mean, we have what we call routine emergencies. Um just because it is what it is. Okay, enough of the morbidity. Let's talk <laughs> about the excitement of it. Okay, so you're up there. You're you're staring down this cliff. You're going through a meditation. You're picking your lines. You're reviewing your different strategies. You get to the edge, and then you... Jump. Jump. And so is that that first step? It is. Uh, it's the most... Everyone reacts differently. For me, it is the most calming quiet effect in the world and it's gotten to the point now to where like the more you do something you train your body and you train your brain for it so the first few times i'm base jumping i would experience time dilation like everything would go by super fast and when i train people i notice the same thing it's like hey tell me what happened on that jump i want to hear their recollection of it um because a lot of times it's different than what i saw um but then, you know, over time, you get better at actually remembering what happens. And then you have time dilation in the other way. And I remember times where, like, I had a two-hour conversation with myself in my head. And it was like a split second actually went by. So time dilation stretches the other way. But you train your awesome body shit. and you get used to it. And nowadays, like, so before I do a jump, I do a countdown. I say three, two, one, see ya. Mm -hmm. You do it for a few different reasons. One, you do it for yourself, for conditioning. You do it for any cameraman that might be there. You do it for your friends. Let them know, hey, don't fuck with me for the next three seconds. I'm kind of doing something important. <laughs> okay. And your really good friends will fuck with you every time. Sure. Uh, but it's the point now to where as soon as I say three, my body, I'm instant flow state. The world just goes quiet. Now you, you, you've just trained yourself. Absolutely. I'm only focusing on the object at hand. Everyone's like, oh, it must be such an adrenaline rush. For sure, once I land or once I open up my parachute, mm -hmm. I don't experience any of that during the jump. It is complete calm. It is quiet. It is quieting everything. Every, doesn't matter what's happening in the world. Everything is quiet and nothing matters except that one thing I am doing. That's that's what diving does when I'm in the zone. I, I, I get to that place where it's just super quiet. Time dilations like you're talking about, losing track of time. Sometimes, you know, 20 minutes was actually three hours, you know, and I'm late getting home and my wife's pissed. But also the other the other side of it where it's just like, oh, so much excitement, so much action. How long was that? Oh, it wasn't two hours. It was 15 minutes. Absolutely. So you can get it both ways. But, uh, yeah, I, I know it. I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying on all that. That's, it's a flow state. It's that chemical cocktail being dumped yep. into your brain, and then your body gets used to it and knows it's coming. So then you can step in even quicker. Um, and like I said earlier, spearfishing is the, like it has, I have the same response to that as I do base jumping. It's nuts. And I think a lot of it's cadence and then training my brain. Like I said, in skydiving, it's three, two, one, see ya and free diving and spearfishing. It's okay. It's my last three breaths. And then that gets me and then snorkel out. Boom. I'm there. And so even when I'm dropping down, I'm already in that flow state. You know, there's, there's one other training thing that. I learned underwater that reminds me of exactly what you're talking about. And it's the <clears throat> being able to turn chemicals on and off, turn reactions on and off. So like if I'm down at 30 feet, 40 feet, and I see a really good fish go by, I have to stop my heart from wanting to get excited. Because I know if I do, I'm going to deplete my oxygen and lose my down bottom time. So I can't really spend good time down there to now stalk that fish. Mm -hmm. So it's like I feel that, like, and then I like cut it off, like stop it. 
almost like a one of my buddies who's really into guns. He he told me that's like that's how snipers have to be. They they have to just completely shut off anything that's happening. People walking by, bugs crawling in their ears, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Same kind of thing. I'm I'm not you know. I've only been spearfishing since May. I've been free diving for a year and a half now, but I'm definitely borrowing traits and skills from my other hobbies and applying to them to that. And I'm, I'm that's starting to click for me. I'm finally realizing now, because you know I've, I've got this small gun, so I've got to be on top of fish to stalk yeah, on. Right. I'm going down. I'm looking everywhere, and I'm trying to find that fish and get close. And I'm realizing now, it's in the, in the past few weeks. Wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. No, you've been in similar situations before. Don't look at things unfocus your eyes you know have the end goal in mind and seeing what's changing around you so now when i'm diving down i'm not stalking around looking for fish i'm just nice and relaxed my eyes are probably almost unfocused and i'm just looking i'm looking straight ahead and noticing movement i'm noticing if there's any changes and when that happens like you just said i have to make sure i'm not reacting to it and so mm-hmm. i can actually process what that was because if it was a fish that i want as soon as i react one, not only is my heart rate going to go up, that fish could have noticed me react as well. Mm-hmm. And they have sensitive lateral lines, especially uh, white sea bass and some of those other game fish. They're they're very sensitive to any movements or twitches or noise frequencies or anything, even the little clicking in your ear when you when you equalize all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Boom, gone. See, and I've never done any of those things. I've never been spearfishing in wings. But um, I, I've been wanting to try spearfishing because – I'm always putting myself in danger doing crazy shit and I live to feel that adrenaline, but I feel like I I could be pretty good at spearfishing only because every time I go out, you know, to the beach with buddies and they're afraid to get in the water, you know, they, they jump in right away, but I just take a moment to kind of think, relax. And when I get in, you know, I take my time and my heart's racing because, you know, you just, we don't have the cleanest waters, whatever, mm-hmm. but, you know, they, they don't want to go out too deep. But once I get in the zone and I just click, I can go out and I'm out and I'm just floating and, you know, and I'm swimming, not, no fear, nothing. And these guys are like, you know, damn, it's just fucking crazy. Like he's all the way out <laughs> well, there. Well, you're, you're ready. Like, you know, and, and, I, and I'm like, dude, like I've, I've been this way for such a long time and it's like I'm missing out on something. Like there has to be a reason why I just have this this thing where I can just control myself and really think about where I'm at and not lose my cool and be calm. Mm-hmm. Because when I'm out there, I'm fucking out there and you'll see me and I, you people say, dude, it's like you just disappeared. Mm-hmm. You know, and I remember there was a time when I was in Long Beach um, over in Naples, Naples Island. I, I swam out and I saw like this pot of dolphins and I'm like, fuck, I want to go out there. And something inside me just said, just go, you know, and there was a dude just swimming back, swimming out but he was like rushing out there, you know, and then he swam back. But in my head, I just took my time. I I clicked and I just swam as far as I could. But eventually it just went away. Mm-hmm. But in my head, I was thinking, fuck, where is this coming from? Like, why do I have well, this? Well, that, that, that's and why you got to go same, get your wetsuit, Poppy. Yeah. And it's Poppy, like, go get your wetsuit. I had the same feeling when we went Don't skydiving. think about it. Be about it. Go do it. Make you know, it and, it get, and it gets me excited because I'm like, fuck, like, I can't just I hear you're calling, waste. Poppy. You know, it's like, I... I don't want to look, you know, 10 years from now, look back and be like, fuck, now I can't do that because I have a kid or because of whatever. I mm-hmm. can't. It just, it has to be used. You say yes, <laughs> try it, see what happens. Some of the, the best things that have ever happened to me in life is because I, I just immediately said yes. Now, that's not necessarily like taking on a lot of extra risk. There's also like the no downside factor. Is there, you know, yes, there's risk in you swimming out to meet a pot of dolphins, but there's not risk in you hopping in the ocean and, you know, with your buddies. Yep. So if there's no downside... Fuck it, do it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's that's led me to a lot of fun things in life. Yeah. And I swam back because I thought, well, what if they're hunting something? Or what if I get too close and they start to like, what is this? You know, what the fuck? I don't know. It was, But I didn't freak out. But I definitely thought, well, maybe it wasn't meant to be. Good thing they went away. <laughs> <laughs> so sitting on the edge of the cliff, here's something, here's something I, I, I want to share. Like with, uh, <clears throat> now I haven't seen sh- uh, big great white sharks out there yet. Knock on wood. Mm-hmm. I'm sure I will at some point. But... You know, every time we're talking about going to uh, San Clemente Island and, you know, Eric Bagnados, he's one of the guys in the club. He's like, Eric, we're going to uh, Clemente. Are you okay diving with great white sharks around? You know, that's what he says. It's like, oh, yeah, 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 I guess so. And inside I'm going, <laughs> uh, and I've been out to Clemente now but so many times. 
I'm starting to lose count, which is good. That means I'm getting out there a lot. But mm-hmm. but that's what you think about when you jump in the water. You're like, okay, here we go. Metering tuna at 60 feet, at 50 feet. Time to jump in. And it's a little bit murky. And it's like, fuck, okay. Just kick down, kick down. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. Just go, 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 go. Calm down. Relax, relax, relax. But that's that's the intensity it's like it's like how you said your closest friends will, will always be there to kind of you know give disrupt you shit. yeah, yeah. Give totally you shit just put thoughts in your head and call that's you it. a pussy and tell you to get in the water <laughs> yeah right <laughs> oh man but yeah no. so so you got any more jumps planned uh soon or what's going on yeah this year's been a slow year for covid uh i went to arizona in february made some great jumps out there always doing the winter because it gets way too fucking hot any other time right uh and then covid hit uh and a few things happened at once the community you know there's no rules around base jumping like we're kind of self-governing so as a result you have different opinions within the community and the community is kind of torn but initially everyone mostly came to the same conclusion of hey there's a few things happening here that we don't know one we shouldn't probably be getting hurt and be a burden on the healthcare system right now um and two, a lot of the great jumps are in various secluded areas. You know, Moab is a town of 3,000 people in the winter. Uh, they balloon in the summer. But in the winter, there are 3,000 people. They have two ICU beds. So if all these base jumpers aren't working, go to Moab and bring COVID with them. It's like the town's fucked. Yeah, yeah, that's a... Uh... So that was kind of happening in the beginning as well. And so I kind of respected the wish of the locals and stopped traveling to base. And also, you couldn't really fly anywhere. Uh, so yeah, this, this was a slow year. I've done some jumps here and there. Um, just some solo jumps. I, I love jumping by myself. I also like diving by myself. I know it's not advised. Um, but usually September, I'll spend almost the entire month in Switzerland. This is the first time I'm not going to Switzerland in a long time. And it sucks. Like I miss that place like crazy. Where do you go? Where do you go there? Interlaken? Where? So just, uh, God, I was getting my North and South confused as dumb as that sounds. It's just South of Interlaken. It's called Lauterbrunnen. Okay. Um, it's this, I'm half Swiss, and uh, my brother and my mother and some of my family members live in uh, Lucerne. Okay. Yeah, so Lauterbrunnen is just like the mecca for base jumping because you take the gondola. Instead of you know a six-hour hike, you take the gondola to the top, 20-minute hike to the edge, and you fly down. You can do it however many times yeah, a day as lot, you want. Yeah, lots of gondolas and trains and, and trams and all kinds of stuff that go up to these. And, you know, some of these trains go up at an angle like this. Oh, yeah, 45 degrees. And, they're, and the cars are designed like that, too. It's like... The seats are like this, but the train is angled like that, and it goes mm-hmm. up. It's it's yeah, crazy. The bench in front of bench in front of you is a few feet below you, and the bench behind you is a few feet above you. They they it's, are totally designed and equipped and engineered for dealing with high, quick alpine ascents. Mm-hmm. And then I go to uh, crazy a town called Waldenstadt as well. It's mm-hmm. more you know where that's at. Yep. Are you a skier? Snowboarder. Do you ever go to Chasserog? I'm probably butchering the name. No Sasve, but not okay. there. So same thing. It's a big ski town. Well, I'll take the gondola to the top. And it, they, they know us by now, but like you could tell like when there's someone new working there, they're like, what do you mean one way? You're, are you hiking down? Like, no, you'll see me in, a, in an hour or so. But yeah, you, you take the, the gondola up, you hike 20 minutes to the edge of the cliff and you fly down and it's like a minute and a half wingsuit flight. So the video you saw on my Instagram of me flying through the crack, that's Waldenstadt. Let's the, play that one. The interesting thing, yeah, let's, let's play it right, right now. Right now! It's like, wow, that was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the cool thing about that one is I'm starting, I, my, I always book an apartment on one side of the mountain and I take the gondola up and I fly down to another town on the other side of the mountain range. So then it takes me either two trains and a bus or one train and two buses to get back around to the other no, side of the mountain. I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's just a magical place. I, I miss Switzerland. So how do you, so are you able to, are you pre-plan those jumps too? You like look at the mountain and you study previous jumps or is it a little bit more uh, free form, if you will? No, definitely. I mean, to, I said no 
it's a combination. It's, it's not freeform at all, but a lot of jumps you're working off of your previous jumps. So you fly a line, you collect all that data, and you fly a line that's very conservative. And the next time, the data probably hasn't changed that much, but you know what your performance was in the previous one. So you can you can step it down or step it up depending on what you want to do. Okay, yeah. So, so like if you look at some of my videos from there, I wasn't flying through the crack the first couple times I did it. That's insane. I, the people that do that are eventually going to die, and, and they do. Sure. Um, and there's other videos of me like, you know, flying through the trees. There's no way I would do that in the first couple jumps. You, you, again, the stuff you see online is maybe 5%. You're not seeing the training jumps. You're not seeing the quote unquote boring jumps. Or what I would Everything it gets to that comfort level. Exactly. Yeah. You're kind of seeing top level is what you're saying. Got it. Cool, Crazy. man. Well, shoot, man. George, you got anything else? Oh, uh, is there anywhere that you have, um, on your list but you have a bucket list exactly. yeah a jump list a superman bucket list a lot you know i've been to a lot of places around the world but more places keep popping up but norway and south africa have been on my list for a really long time italy it's you know as the wingsuit technology gets better it's allowing us to jump and fly in more and more places so we used to need like a, a really big sheer start so like I don't know, like 900 feet of straight down to get the wingsuit flying and it's gotten to the point now to where 200 300 feet will do and okay. like a so lot that of people, opens more doors to more places absolutely yeah so but south africa's on the list norway's always been on the list italy's on the list france there's just anywhere with mountains can you can you jump off the uh empire state building or they won't let you they definitely will not let you in fact Beijing, can you do the eiffel tower uh no i no. know someone so none, of the, got none of the towers and buildings are gonna they're gonna kibosh that right uh there's a lot of places around the world that have welcomed it so i i think uh <clears throat> i've got some pictures on my instagram of me jumping off the buildings in malaysia and jumping off buildings in benidorm um so they host events and they bring us out and it's a lot of fun and it, it's tourism dollars for them and it's publicity for them and man it's a lot of fun Jumping dude i got one for amazing. you how about uh, have you ever climbed everest i have not I haven't either. But what if, <laughs> <laughs> cool story. What if you could true story? What if you could climb Everest and jump off Everest? Is there enough steepness there to like Wouldn't he freeze or with a suit? Uh, I don't know if I don't know if I That would be now to me that would be the ultimate Superman move. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to be Superman, I want to see you hike Everest and then jump off and fly okay. down to base camp. Well, let's ask, you know, what is it what would a suit require for you to do that? Uh, no real changes to the suit, but definitely, I mean, uh, protection against the elements. So you know, and higher altitude. So would you have the, the air thinner? Oxygen, so sure. so so you would you would have less uh, lift maybe in your suit. You you would definitely be flying. Fat. You would not be getting as good glide ratio. Superman, sure. damn it! <laughs> no, that's but you'd not be flying for a while in really cold conditions as well with low oxygen too. So you definitely need supplemental oxygen for something like that. Have you ever thought of doing like, uh, you know, like that dude that did the Red Bull thing where he got went up in the balloon See, and just jumped out? Mm -hmm. There you go. So he, w would you ever do something like that? Probably not. Not that high, right? So like what what would be the max height that you'd want to jump and actually try to deploy your 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 suit? and, and For a wingsuit? For a wingsuit, yeah. I mean, there's guys that go out there to set records. Um, now, what is that record? How high is that? I'm pretty sure the current record uh, is my buddy Kyle – uh, and I know it's over 10 miles and I can't remember how long it was. And he had 10, 10 miles up. No, no, no. Horizontally. Oh, horizontally. Okay. Yeah. What I, about, what about elevation? Or, or I know he had supplemental oxygen, but I don't remember how high they went. Okay. Well, if you got up to the upper layers of the atmosphere, do you know what you would see up there? What's that? Aliens. <laughs> I have another question. Yes. Before you get into that, Eric. Okay. Um, cause you, you know, that's coming. Kids? Oh, I knew it was coming. I'm ready for of it. Of course it is. Do you have kids? Do not have kids. Actually, just assigned adoption papers today for a dog, which is a huge step for me. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, that, well, that's kind of like a kid. Would you like some oh, syrup? Would like, you like yeah, some uh, tangerine love? Look, they even printed the, the the bottle upside down. Yeah, I've noticed they've been doing that with their branding. Not sure that what that's about. It, well, I guess to them it's like leave no bottle unturned. Oh, Maestro, yeah, bring that glass over here. Oh. They will not go on skate. Well, uh, do you plan on having kids if you find the right 
So I've been dating the same woman for three years, uh, three and a half. She um, seems really nice and really pretty and very athletic. She is. She is perfect for me. Uh, she puts up with my craziness and she does. She has her own stuff that she's into as well. So we have shit that we love to do together. And then when I'm doing my crazy shit, she's often her crazy shit. Nice. So it works. Um, I don't know. You know, we talked about it er- a couple times early on. I initially said, no, I, I really don't for-, for a number of reasons. She said, well, I, I kind of always planned on it, but... I think that's because that's like what you're supposed to do. Um, probably need to talk about it some more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're at, wow, we're just, putting him on the spot, Jorge. We're at a point in our life where uh, we're insanely busy just living life to the fullest and just yeah. having an amazing time. Hey, you know uh, what? If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We've been talking about getting a dog for two years. It's just a matter of we did, weren't re- sure baby if we were steps. ready for that commitment. Baby steps. Yeah. Oh, she's got a enough. great career that just, but she works like 50, 60 hours a week for it. Uh, yeah. So, and I'm not going to be a stay at home dad. I told her that. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of did that. Well, yeah, kind of, uh, sort of. I was I'm, just, I'm still the, the backup. My wife works at a, at a hospital and she's works lots of hours and has the big job. So mm-hmm. I'm, daddy, uh, I'm daddy daycare. I was curious because I thought, well, I mean, you do so much amazing, crazy shit. It's like when you have a kid, will you stop and will you have him follow him or her following your footsteps? So you're assuming we have to we have to have the assumption then that I did decide to have a kid. Yes, um, I would definitely stop base jumping for sure. Um, and in fact, I'm going to stop at some point anyway. Like that's something like you can't just go on forever. Like you have to have some sort of an exit strategy. Sure. Because you don't want the crude's portrait. Well, what happens is you're gonna you know if you just slow down. Like first stupid. of all, when you get older, so you stupid. have to slow down. Mm-hmm. And if you slow down to a certain point then you're not staying current. And that's when it gets really dangerous. So at some point you have to make the decision to quit. And that usually comes when you like, you slow down to the point to where you're being dangerous. So I was already planning on quitting base jumping eventually. If I had a kid, definitely would. The skydiving thing, I don't think so. It's, it's still really, really safe activity. It sounds way safer than the, than the, the suit. Oh, absolutely. Flying through cracks of cliffs and into trees and up, up and away and, yeah. So, uh, what kind of dog did you get? We are adopting a. It's a. It's it's an American mutt, uh, but definitely got some pit bull in it for sure. That's nice. pretty dominant. Uh, Male, female, female. Nice. Fifty pounds, about a year and a half. If oh, wow, that's yep. pretty. <laughs> damn, that's cool. Yeah, I got a uh, miniature schnauzer. Oh, cool. And she's only like 20, 21 pounds. Mm-hmm. She's great. Super smart. Super yappy. Yeah, but. Did- Whatever. It's, I can't afford a kid right now, so... There you go. Dogs are, I mean, dogs are better still, anyway. Yeah, and I'm still planning to do crazy shit, so... There you go. Do you know what I ask of all our guests? You, ha- you have to hold him. Okay. For just a moment. Look into his eyes for just a moment. Mm-hmm. What do you see? I uh, see a blue man. Do you have any flashbacks? It's got tits. Were you, were you abducted ever? So it's interesting you say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, that hey, blue man is non-binary. <laughs> I grew up... Ter- and I've only told a few people this, but I knew you're George. Make it. sure you show this. He's here. He's. <laughs> I grew up absolutely terrified of aliens. You were abducted. I believed as a kid, I was. You were. No, no, no. What, let me let me rephrase that. I don't think I was abducted. When I was growing up, I thought that I was being visited, um, and it wasn't until I was in my late twenties that I actually figured out what the fuck was happening. Um, are you guys familiar with parasomnia? No. So parasomnia is a, uh, it's a sleep disorder, and there's a lot of symptoms that go along with it. Brux- bruxism, which is grinding your teeth. Mm-hmm. People are familiar with that. Yep. Uh, sleep talking, mm-hmm. sleepwalking, mm-hmm. night terrors, and sleep paralysis. So ever since I was a little kid, I've had all of those. So, But no one really ever explained it to me. Um, I had a, finally had a sleep study done when I was like in my mid-20s, um, and that was when they diagnosed it. But yeah, growing up, my mom was always like, you and your sister both would like be yelling at each other in your sleep, completely incoherent, but you'd be yelling at each other. I'd pull a paranormal activity on her all the time. She'd just wake up and I'd be standing over her bed. No clue of how I got there. Crazy. I'd wake up in random places. But another thing that was happening to me was sleep paralysis. And that's when your mind's awake, but your body's not. And you're also like in a mild state of hallucination. So you're kind of aware that of where you are but you're also seeing things that aren't there yeah and so when i was a little kid i would see i would have sleep paralysis to where i couldn't fucking move but i would see these shapes 
uh, these figures like in my room at night. It fucking terrified me. Like, what and, if they, what if they were actually were figures in your room? <laughs> because we have science, and so we know now what it actually was. I'm not saying yeah. there's not aliens. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying what happened to me with sleep paralysis. Okay. Oh, but but you know, there's a lot of people that talk about interdimensional beings and beings that that feed off of. Uh, our, our psychic energy subconscious. and subconscious subconscious energy and all that stuff. And all of the things we just talked about could coexist mutually. Mm-hmm. So I could have experienced mm-hmm. sleep paralysis and everything you just said could be true as well. Maybe the paralysis was caused by something else that was going on. Hey, it's possible. It's possible. We had, we had a few guys in here that talked about that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've never experienced the pr- sleep paralysis or. Well, you know, I, I had a sleep paralysis one time with uh, my roommate and my guitar player in the band that I was in for many, many years, one of my best friends, Renee, we, we uh, both had the same experience at night, and he was in his room, I was in my room. We weren't in the same room, but... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you... it's... it's okay, buddy. But, it's okay. Yeah, it's... yeah. So anyways... You know what? Let's touch on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think we need to touch. Do... We don't need to do any more touching. <laughs> touch, touch. <laughs> touch, touch, touch. Who touched who? Yes. No, but we both had the same experience, and it was this really weird, freaking crazy thing. And how were we both having the same experience of like a paralysis thing and like seeing something? And I don't know. Anyways. Bad juju. Bad juju. Was it? Was yeah. it the? Uh, There's a. Was it the bacon site cheese under under that? Was it the Western bacon cheeseburger from Johnny Rockets? That's probably what I, it was, and all the beer you guys <laughs> drank. Yeah, right. All the weed you guys smoked. <laughs> all the Molly you guys took. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> oh, that's funny. No, so anyways, well, you know, we, we have to ask everybody on our show because that's one of the things on our show. Absolutely. We just, we, we go down that world. Yeah, no, I definitely think, uh, I mean, statistically, it makes sense that there's extraterrestrial life out there. Drake's sure. equation, right? For sure. Yeah. Although it's it's interesting that it's, it's an interesting concept, but the actual equation itself, like, isn't correct at all. Like, didn't he predict, like, we should have seen something, but, like... I think the theory, the idea behind that is, or the explanation where why we haven't been visited is maybe we're just on this like super back world arm of the back of the galaxy. But Drake's equation predicted a lot of fucking life. Yeah, it did. But keep in mind, you ever you ever watch like Star Trek: The Next Generation? Dude, or any, are okay. you kidding me? All right. So Prime Directive. What is a Prime Directive? Right. So, so you're you, thinking you like not, a human. You do not interfere with the evolution of um, a lesser evolved Not only are you thinking organism. like a human, you're thinking like an American. That's what it is, Eric. So I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying that would be a stretch to think others are thinking that way. Or too. or maybe maybe this is just a an ant farm and it has it has a process that's preordained by far more advanced beings. Could be and <laughs> And maybe it's all happening right in front of our eyes and we don't even realize well, it. Man, if, back in 2016, when I was telling you when people were just dropping dead left and right, my community, some, some of us were having serious, serious discussions about simulation theory. Like, we were like, dude, look at the chances of all of this happening. Do we really think statistically that's the thing? Or does it make more sense that this is some sort of crazy fucking simulation? And we, we were your, your simulation theories. Remember all our, remember all, all our simulation conversations. Oh, yeah. Yep. It's just certain things, you know, never seem to add up. Certain, you know, some years like 2016 for you, just well, you know that that like uh, you know 16th century, 17th <clears throat> century painters hit a lot of stuff in their paintings. There's like all kinds of shit in this guy. All kinds of things, even in Michelangelo's paintings. Yeah, those guys never did drugs ever. I'm not saying they didn't. <laughs> I'm not saying they and didn't. An artist, you know, never, never. No, do they, stuff like they, they don't do that. Moses, Moses, oh, Moses saw a burning bush, right? Yeah, he, mm-hmm. he and it was have. God talking to him. Did and he, he did he do drugs? The, uh, the Red Sea. Is that what it was? We, we don't. See. We you don't that, fucking know. That might be a coincidental thing. There may have been something happening at the same time. Yeah. There, there may have been a, a natural event. Tide. He's like, oh, <laughs> opportunity to take advantage of. <laughs> Who knows? You know what I do know? What do you know? Is that we're all having fun. Fuck yeah. That's In all that matters. simulation. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this has been a great simulation, I have to say. 2020, is, it's funny. I was thinking the other day, did you guys ever play the video game SimCity? Yeah. Yeah. So 
I did not. I think 90% of people, and maybe you were one of them, maybe you weren't, inevitably, when you got bored, what did you do? Destroy. Just turned on every fucking mm-hmm. natural disaster to see what would happen. Yep. Dude, that kind of feels like 2020. Yeah, you just get bored and it's you're like, like well, it, right. it really kind of reinforces simulation. Deploy, theory. deploy. It's like, let's just, you know, we're, this is getting boring. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And could very well be. You know, I remember I had that game when I was young, like maybe sixth grade, and I was doing that because mm-hmm. I got so bored, you know, and I wasn't even just a kid. Whatever. <laughs> let's see what happens. So who knows what's really going on? I mean, who knows? Or maybe nothing's going on, and we're just well, you know in what? Space by ourselves. You know what? I I think that the, uh, the 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 doctrine and the narrative that wants to be explained is a certain way, and any deviation from that is a loss of control. So that's why you know I have you hold little guys like that, <clears throat> mm-hmm. like this little guy right here, little you know, non-binary. <laughs> There was an agreement. Oh, guys. Everybody has to be quiet, okay? There's a certain narrative that must be explained. Anyways, is it, is it a male or female? Oh, you got to. It, it's kind of weird. They got they got asexual. Right? Yeah, no, like they got what she said. Like, yeah, it right. can be a male or a female, or an aphid, or a clownfish. Clownfish do the same thing. Yep. They change sex. Yep. See, that's why in in uh, Jurassic Park they say nature finds a way. So maybe those Tyrannosaurus Rex were also. You know, like could could change sex when needed, on demand, mm-hmm. on demand. Sheephead, yeah, sheephead. Yeah. It, all kinds of animals do that. All kinds of animals change sex. That's when we watched. Uh, Even humans now. Humans change sex now too. It's crazy. It's all there. When I watched Finding Nemo, I'm like, why is Nemo complaining about not having a mom? His dad's gonna become one pretty soon. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a little, little, little nerdy with that one. Little nerdy. <laughs> yeah, but I watched it like now, and I'm like, hey, it's good stuff. Let's man. explain to a kid that that Nemo's dad, mom, is a hermaphrodite. Actually, uh. they're starting to explain that now to our kids. Yeah, it's it's you know it's they're the fu- trying to enlighten everybody to this whole Eric, sixty-seven genders thing. Is the future non-binary? I don't know. Who knows? All I know is you won't be around. My kids will be around. They'll By have to then, deal with it. I'll have to deal with it, whatever it is. Yeah, you'll kind of have just, to deal with it. Life goes on. That's right. Changes. It does. All right, man. Thank you for Dude. stopping by. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great conversation. It's a good time. Dude, absolutely. And I can't wait to put this one up with all the videos we saw and, and, and on your Instagram and we're playing for these guys. It's fucking crazy. I know, dude. We live vicariously through you. Totally. Glad just, you guys enjoy it. Just watching it just gets my heart going. I'm like, oh, shit. I'm just watching you slowly creep to the edge. and boop, 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 boop. <laughs> Yeah, and thank you for coming by because you drove a long way. I mean, uh, 30, 40 minutes? Yeah, in ter- California time, that's like nothing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, 30, 40 minutes, long you. time. Really, George? <laughs> You got you guys have a serious bubble down here, huh? Yeah, we do. See, I'm, I'm a transplant. See, I grew up in Kentucky, so it's like driving. It's not that bad. Wow. Yeah, you got to you got to drive like an hour to get to the next major city, right? Next major city? No. From where I lived there it was more like two and a half hours in one direction, okay. one and a half in the next. Right here, the next major city is 15 minutes away. <laughs> Ten you know, minutes away. If we lived up north, like Fresno area, yeah, then it'd be different. Fuck that place. But, right. you know, yeah. like down here, everything's close by. Yeah. Fresno's a very interesting area. <laughs> Just that, that whole corridor. I used to have to work up there a lot. Ugh. The air. <laughs> Man, you got you to gotta, you gotta like the smell of cow shit. You, you do, for sure. Madeira smells yeah. like shit. Oh, yeah. All right, you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Joe, for coming by and sharing all your stories. That was this was a fun night. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Good to get to know you better, too. Thank you. All right. All right, man. See you, everybody. Late.